Venga. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, now we're starting with our webinar for today. And um, here we are with Russell Stannard. And I had to tell you about Russell, that Russell is the founder of www.teachertrainingvideos.com, an award-winning website that offers free help videos for teachers who want to incorporate technology into their teaching and learning. He is an Anile associate trainer and tutors on the MA program. He also currently tutors on the MA in digital technology at King's College University, London. Russell was previously a principal teaching fellow at the University of Warwick and the University of Westminster. He was received the Times Higher Outstanding Innovative in Technology, the British L. Tons Innovation Award, and the University of Westminster Excellence in Teaching Award. He is truly an international speaker, having presented in 51 countries. He writes a regular, um, a regular column in the English Teaching Professional and the Express Publishing Teacher's Corner. Russell has published widely on the topic of feedback, flipped classroom, and assessment. And today, our presentation is about evaluation. Uh, the name of this presentation is Evaluating and Assessing Students When Teaching Fully Online. This is, you know, a very controversial topic. I know that many people are interested in knowing um, in this new situation how to evaluate, how to evaluate have informative assessment. That is what uh, Russell Stannard is going to highlight today. And I would like to um, read uh, the summary of this um, uh, presentation before I give uh, Russell the floor. It says here, Russell has been teaching online for 20 years. In this talk, he will focus on some of the techniques and tools that can be used to evaluate and assess our students online. A highly practical talk full of real examples as well as a range of possible approaches. The focus will be on formative assessment across a range of skills as well as Russell's award-winning work around feedback. And here we have, uh, I give the floor to Russell Stannard. I'm very proud and TESOL um, Cole IS is very proud and honored to have Russell Stannard with us today. Uh, welcome Russell to our webinar series. Hi, oh, lovely, lovely to the first time that I've ever done a presentation online for TESOL. So uh, hopefully this is going to be of interest to you. While I'm doing the presentation, because I'm going to be sharing some different things with you, I'll turn off my webcam because simply it will, it will keep the, the flow of the presentation uh, nice and uh, keep it nice and easy. So I'll turn my webcam off for now. Um, and Allegra, I don't know if you can do the same maybe as well. So I'm gonna just turn off my webcam and just come over to um, where I wanna start uh, my presentation. So just get it up onto the screen. One second. So just to quickly say to you, this is my website. It's teachertrainingvideos.com. And, uh, you know, as, as Allegra says, I basically work in the area of teacher training. I train teachers in using technology. This is a very popular website. And basically all I do is I make videos that help teachers to incorporate technology into their teaching and learning. And you can just come on the website and make use of the content. It's all free. There's no tricks. If you're looking to learn about Zoom or you're looking to learn about online teaching, then you can make use of this website and um, hopefully uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. I'm just going to start with a quick uh, show you where I'm from and I was thinking what I'm going to, how I was going to do this and I thought, well, I'll take you on Google Earth and I was thinking about where I might take you and I thought, well, I'm not sure that all of you have been to London, so I was going to just quickly uh, teach you a few things about London by taking you right into the center of London. So I'm just clicking now and we're going to fly off right into the center of London to where uh, I wasn't born here, but I was born not that far away. What we can see here now is London and that is Big Ben. So I was born about uh, five miles from Big Ben, I guess. Um, 
And I often use this at the beginning of the lesson to teach the students a little bit about the history of different places. I take them all around the world, give them some little information. Then afterwards, I ask the students to tell me what did they understand? Sometimes I ask them to write the, an the answers in the chat window. Sometimes I ask them to speak and uh, do it orally. So this is a lovely tool, Google Earth, for doing this. I'm just gonna stop it a minute. We can move in and out uh, with Google Earth. Here we can see Big Ben, it's actually being repaired at the moment. So you can see all the repairs on the outside. But Big Ben is not actually the name of the clock. Big Ben is actually the name of the bell that is inside the clock. So people get confused. They always think that Big Ben is the name of the clock, but it's not. Actually, the clock is called, the or the tower is called the Queen Elizabeth Tower. Next to Big Ben is the Houses of Parliament here. This is obviously the River Thames. And if we just flick around a little bit, we can do that by moving around here. And this is quite nice. We can see that this is Westminster Bridge. And here is where they measure the distances from. So when they say London to Liverpool, 250 mile, or London to Leeds, 270 mile, then they're actually measuring it from here, from Westminster Bridge. That is where the, the plaque is that shows uh, the distances. Um, just one other little couple of other little things just to show you. So we, when we're working with um, these tools, we can go in 2D or 3D. It's a lovely technology to, to show to your students. And one thing I can do here, interestingly enough as well, the London Eye there is on literally opposite where Big Ben is. So in this area of London, uh, lots to see. This is a fantastic walk along here. It's called the South Bank of London. And if you want a really good view of London, the best thing to do is cross over Westminster Bridge and go here. You can take the best pictures of Big Ben and the best pictures of the famous Houses of Parliament. And we could actually go down and quickly visit the Houses of Parliament. Just the last thing, I'm going to just take you down, zoom down. So I often do this in the lesson. And if we come down here, what we can see on the other side of the road there, and I can even zoom in a little bit, is a statue of Richard I. And Richard I was actually the king that you often see mentioned in the stories of Robin Hood. So Richard was the I was uh, the good king. Uh, king John had taken over and Richard I, so there he is. Actually, Richard I hardly spent any time in England at all. Most of the time, he was traveling around France and he was involved in the Crusades. But if you ever come to the Houses of Parliament in London, that is where uh, you'll see him. So I often start a lesson like this. I take students on little visits, different places all around the world, and then I introduce them. And then afterwards I say, OK, can you remember anything I've told you and get them to speak orally or to write in the chat room uh, their ideas? So it can be a really nice way to um, do a lesson. Right, we're going to start uh, our flipped classroom um, lecture and I'm just going to jump out of stop sharing, come back again and this time what I want to do is just jump into my assessment. So I click here and I'm just going to click on the button and we're going to start basically to look at the area of assessment. So for example, today's activity, if I was doing it in the class with the students afterwards, I might say, okay, tell me something about Richard the Lionheart. Tell me something about the bell. Tell me something about London Eye. Tell me something about Queen Elizabeth Tower. So I turn it into a speaking activity. First, introduce them to an interesting place and then see what they can remember. So it's just a little activity. So what I want to do today is talk about when we teach online, how our roles change. When we teach online, we're delivering our teaching and learning in a very different way. And so if we're gonna teach in a different way and students are gonna develop different skills, we need to think about how we're gonna assess. We need to assess in a different way. And I'm really gonna take you on a journey that almost started 12 years ago, about 2007, 2008, of how I got to the point that I'm at now. And in, in taking you on that journey, I'm gonna show you three, kind of three different ideas around, around assessment that hopefully you might find interesting. I'm gonna make it practical. It's gonna start with a little bit of a story, and then we're gonna 
uh, do some practical, see some practical examples. I've asked permission from some of my students if I can show you examples of their work, examples of the things I do, and hopefully you'll find this uh, interesting. So off we go. When you teach online, just like really when you think about blended learning, there are big changes in the way we're working with students. One of the biggest problems when you teach online, and you might have already come across this if you suddenly started to teach online, is that the students play a bigger role. When a student is in an online situation, let's say, for example, using Zoom, when they're in a situation like that, they need to know how to operate Zoom. They need to know how to, for example, screen share. They need to know how to access content on their computer when they're doing a Zoom class with their teacher. So there's actually quite a lot more involvement from the students. And also because generally when we teach online, the students have less contact with their teachers. At the moment, what's happening is everyone's doing a lot of Zoom classes. But in reality, when you run an online course, you don't have so much direct contact with your students. So therefore, the role of the student changes slightly. So it's not now so it, we've got to get our students to become more autonomous because we need the students to be more engaged in the learning because it's likely that we're going to have less contact with them. So that's another reason why the roles change. Students' position in an online course is very different to students' position in a traditional blended or face-to-face -face course. But there are other factors why students' role is changing and that's obviously to do with society the way that the internet has evolved over the last 20 30 years means that more than ever now students have access to learning content when i started teaching students had minimal contact with english they might have a course book they might have a maybe a reader if they're lucky they might have had a cassette but back in 1987 they had minimal access to content these days, students have massive amounts of access to content. This also changes the role of the teacher and changes the role of the student because now the teacher is not the only provider of material. In fact, in most cases, in some cases, the, the teacher's role in terms of language contact and language provisional can actually be secondary to other things that the students might decide to do to try and learn English. We also know that the role of the student and the teacher has changed because we understand teaching nowadays to be much more collaborative. We pull on the theories of Vygotsky. We talk about the tradition of communicative language teaching back in the 1960s and the 1970s in both England and America. And so we understand that teaching and learning now is much more about the students being involved in the process and less about um, less about the, the teacher feeding the information to the students. So learning has really changed. And part of that has been a different understanding of assessment as well. So when we think of assessment now, we're not really doing assessment to teach anymore. We're actually doing assessment to help students learn. Assessment is part of the learning process. It always was, but it's now recognized much more being so. So for all of these reasons, the role of the teacher has kind of changed and the role of the student has changed. Now, this has had a massive impact on how we think about assessment. We want assessment to be collaborative. In other words, we don't want necessarily that the students are always being working on their own. We want to reflect the fact that learning is collaborative and we want to make assessment collaborative. We want assessment to be inclusive. That means we want assessment that includes a whole variety of different activities, not always written, not always focused on a very narrow number of areas. Now we might be encouraging our students, for example, to record themselves speaking and bring that into the activity. There might be activities that we want to assess where the students are working collaboratively and we're looking at the team building and how they work in groups. 
we understand that assessment is formative. OK, we understand, of course, that assessment is summative, but the role of formative assessment in learning is very important. We understand that part of assessment is reflection. So when a student does something, when they do an activity, they need to reflect on it. Could they do it better the next time? How did they organize what they did? So there's many, many reasons why we can say that assessment has really changed. And it's really to do with the fact that the role of the teacher and the student have changed massively. So when we're trying to look at assessment now, it's very challenging. We're not looking at those very old traditional test type functions of testing. We're looking at a much broader way that assessment is part of the learning cycle. So the start of my journey, and as I said, this is a journey and I promise you that I'm gonna show you some really practical stuff, but I'm gonna just take you on a journey. It goes way back to probably, uh, it goes in fact back to when I first started, uh, when I first returned to England in 2000, I did a master's degree in multimedia education. And then I started to teach Spanish at uh, a local college while I was doing my degree. And one of the things that I was really interested in was getting my students to speak. So I was really wanted to make get my students to actually speak and practice speaking. So I shifted the assessment by getting or including in the assessment the idea that the students would record themselves and then share those recordings with me. Now, when I first did this, I did this only with audio. They weren't using video of any description at all. I was just getting my students to record themselves. And at the beginning, it was nothing to do with assessment. It was just a simple trial to say to my students, okay, we're gonna do some preparation in the class, and then I want you to do your recordings at home, and then I want you to send them to me, okay? Now, in reality, and this is really early on. People still didn't have smartphones then. It had to be done on the internet. And I had massive resistance, massive resistance. Very few students did it at the beginning. So we would prepare activities in the class. Maybe let's say I was going to ask them to describe a picture or do a presentation or talk about their family or talk about a particular friend or somebody they admire. We would do the preparation stage in the class so that they really kind of felt confident about what they was going to record. Remember, they were going to do this in Spanish and then they would record themselves at home, share that audio with me. And then often I would give feedback in the class. Now, I'm going to be honest. The first time I did this out of about 13 students, one student did it. One student did the recording. And what I did was in the lesson, I played back their recording. And I said, look, this Tom, or I can't remember the name of the student. Listen, let's all listen to his recording. And then I asked Tom, I said, was that a good exercise? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I had to practice a lot. And then the next week, a few more students did it. And then the next week, a few more students did it. And so at the beginning, it was nothing to do with assessment. I was just trying to encourage my students to practice speaking in Spanish, okay? Nothing more than that. But slowly, students in the class began to realize it was quite a good idea. And by the end, most of the students were trying it out and sending me their recordings. There were problems, there were technical problems, et cetera. It didn't run perfectly, but it was quite an interesting project. Now, luckily, a few years later, I went to work at university. So I moved out of college and I started to work at Westminster. Now at Westminster, we had much more technology, but we were still only using audio. But what I started to do was as part of the assessment, the students had to do three recordings in a year and they had to embed those recordings into their blog. So the students kept a simple blog and they, they had to basically take the recordings that they had and put those video, those recordings into a blog. And then I would give them feedback on the recordings. So we were basically doing one recording a month. Now at this stage, it began to become part of the formal assessment of the school. This is still not completely online. At this stage, I'm still doing, in this particular example, a kind of blended learning course. So we were going in doing classes, and 
then for homework, I was getting the students to, to do these recordings and keep them in a blog. So I would then access the blog, listen to their recordings and give them feedback. So I've moved on from just doing very simple recordings to suddenly building this whole idea up and getting the students now to do these recordings and put them into a blog. And they were starting to work. Wasn't brilliant. Some of the students didn't complete all three recordings. Some did. When we formalized it and said, right, you're going to get a small mark for this work, then obviously students started to take it more seriously. But slowly we were moving towards an understanding about what I could do. Now, the next stage was at this stage when I was doing it, I started to struggle with giving the feedback to the students. And I was thinking, well, why do I always give the feedback to them? Why don't I get the students to self-evaluate their recordings? So what I started to move from, instead of me giving the feedback to the students, I would get the students to do these recordings and then I would give them a questionnaire, which I'll show you at the end. I haven't actually got it prepared, but I think I can show it to you. And I used to give them the students a questionnaire and get the students then to kind of reflect on their own recordings. Now, what I did with this when I was doing this feedback self-evaluation was that I was getting the students to focus on different things. First of all, the process. So how did they prepare to do the recording? Then I'd get them to focus on the recording itself in terms of does it flow? Is the intonation good? Blah, blah, blah. And then afterwards, I'd get them to focus. Later on, I began to do slightly more complicated things where I would get them to screen share. They would actually record themselves speaking, uh, talking over a PowerPoint presentation rather than just audio. I also got them to think about the actual presentation itself. So I'm kind of shifting slowly towards what I would call an e-portfolio. That, that is where I am currently at. And I took this journey. So it wasn't something that I did immediately. Rather, it was something I was building up to. Now, the big break came while I was working now at Warwick University. And we're now in about 2010, 2011. I had lots of experimental classes and I'd read the work of a lady called Icy Lee. And I'm going to give you the reference at the end. Icy Lee is one of my favorite researchers. I come across some work where she was talking about she, as an assessment method. And this, again, was still not online. I'm just about to jump to online as an assessment method. The students would be writing essays. And then for their essay in the class, she would organize them, first of all, so that they got, they had to fill in a self-reflective form about the work they've done. So the first draft of their essay, once they've done the first draft, they would actually be given time in the class with a set of questions to go through and analyze their own essay and how they could improve it. And then they were put into pairs and another student was asked to read the first draft as well. So the students were actually getting on their first drafts, the students were actually getting peer evaluation. That is evaluation from one other student and also doing a self evaluation. And then they were expected to write a second draft. She called this portfolio writing. At the end of the year, the students were asked to choose their favorite of the three essays and to put that forward for formal evaluation. Now, this was a big change for me. Suddenly I was thinking, yeah, this is a really good idea. I could take this same idea from IC Lee and I could get my students to do three recordings during the year. I could get them to self-evaluate and maybe even train them to do peer evaluations. They keep their recordings in a blog. And at the end of the year, they choose the one that they like the best and put that forward for a formal evaluation. Now, I did that at Westminster, at Warwick, sorry, at Warwick University in the year that I was leaving. So 2013, I think this was. This is where I'd got to. And this started to work pretty well. So suddenly, my students, as part of their assessment, these are students learning English, were given three recordings that they had to do each year. And those recordings 
when they did them, they were peer evaluated and self evaluated. They were put into a blog and then the students had to choose one recording that they wanted to be formally assessed. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example just be, to, before I kind of move on to some other things of what that kind of looked like. So we can see. Let me see if I can quickly open up the file where I've got these recordings. I think I've got it here. Let me let me just sorry, just before I do that, let's make sure I've got the audio turned on for you. So when I click on share screen, put the audio on. So hopefully uh, that should make sure that I can play the audio file. Let me just double check where it is now that there it is. OK, OK, I'm going to play. This is an example of a student. So one of her recordings. So she had to do three during the year. And this particular one she was doing about Internet security. Now, by now, I wasn't just asking them to do audio. I was asking them to actually record themselves uh, by using screencast technology, which I will quickly show you in a minute. So let me just play this. I'm hoping that you can hear the audio. So let me just play it. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to talking about uh, security and privacy of electronic business. Uh, I'm Michelle. And uh, if you have any question, please keep it until the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, my presentation can be divided into two parts. The part, first part is the introduction of the security and privacy. The second part is the solution to these problems. OK, let's move on to my presentation. OK, I'm going to stop it there just because of time. So I just wanted to give you kind of an example of exactly what I was what I'm talking about here. So my students were recording themselves talking. And then I was let me just come back to the presentation. Recording themselves speaking, doing free recordings in a year. And then they were getting another student to kind of give them some evaluation on it, some feedback, lots of reflection, thinking about what they've done, how they could do it. I tried to help the students so that the next time, in theory, the third recording should have been the best. But it wasn't always the case. So this is 2013. I decide at this point to leave Warwick University. Now, all of that time, I was doing some online teaching, purely online, but I wasn't really focusing much on the assessment part of it because it wasn't a big part of what I did. Sporadically, I was doing online courses. Suddenly, in 2013, so seven years ago, I shifted completely, completely to teaching online. And then I thought to myself, well, why can't I do e-portfolios? I'm nearly at that position already. Why am I only getting my students to put up examples of audio into their blog? Why can't I extend that and get the students to include other things? And that's how I've moved into ePortfolios, which is the way that I assess all my online courses. OK, and I'll be talking now a bit more and more about this. So I'm using ePortfolio. So basically what's happening at the moment is my students are working with me online and every week they take one of the things that they've produced because I now don't teach English. I do teacher training only. So this is all teacher training at this point. OK. But all the teacher training courses that I'm doing, I did a couple of language classes because I carried on teaching online for about three years, just a small number of groups. But basically from 2013, 80% of my work was teaching online teacher training. But all of the work I was doing now online involved ePortfolios. So let me just take you through the scenario of how I'm doing this. My students are working with me. For example, I've got a new course starting next week. Those students will be working with me online. Every week they'll be doing different things collaboratively, sometimes individually, etc. They are required every week to take one of the things that they've produced, put it into their e-portfolio, and then reflect on what they've done. Because an e-portfolio always has two parts. It has the examples, the content, the proof of learning, 
And secondly, it has a reflection on that learning. Now, normally, when I do this, I give the teachers a lot of it because don't forget, in my case, they're all teachers, okay? But, well, let's call them students. So I give the students a lot of guidance on how to do their e-portfolios. Now, I was doing the same thing in language teaching as well, okay? For a short period between 2013 and 2016, I was doing both teaching English online and doing teacher training online. Both cases, I was using e-portfolios. Now, Mary mentioned at the beginning that I've won some awards and I'm, I'm going to show you towards the end part, partly the reason. If someone was to ask me, Russell, what are the two, are, are there anything you know, that you're really proud of in terms of the work that you've done that you've personally thought, yeah, this is really having an impact. Number one, the, the idea that I had for winning my awards, which I'm going to show you because it kind of links into this. And secondly, this work on e-portfolios. The feedback, when I slowly got this right, the feedback is, is superb. And I picked out an example of a piece of feedback. I'm going to show you some e-portfolios in a minute, show you exactly what I do. I'm going to show you the technology I use. It's going to get more practical now. But I just want you to look at this. This actually was Roberto. So it was an Italian student. Russell, sorry I was so negative about the e-portfolio at the start of the course. I realize now that I didn't know, I didn't know them. Doing this flipped classroom course with you has been great, but the best part was the e-portfolio. I've learned about building a website, embedding content, design and layout, so many things. Now I need to understand more about reflection. I think I understand it better. That's just one piece of feedback from one student who's done a course with me. The course it was a teacher training course, and we were doing a course about flipped classroom and they had to build an e-portfolio where they added one element every week during the course and then they reflected on it. And that was actually part of their formal assessment. This is another student who incidentally, incredibly, is still doing her e-portfolio. Even though the course is finished, she keeps <laughs> keeping her e-portfolio, which is amazing. But this is the single best idea I've ever come across an assessment and I'll definitely try to implement it in my teaching and learning. I honestly have to say that whenever I work with e-portfolios, that at the attitude of the teachers at the beginning is terrible. They're always really negative about the idea. But after a while, they begin to they get really positive about it. Now, I'm actually mentoring people at different universities. For example, I've got a group at King's College University London. I've got some groups, some students in Brook University in Switzerland, where I'm mentoring the teachers who are introducing e-portfolios to their, to their students, okay? So this is becoming more and more common as a way of assessing students, this idea of an e-portfolio. So let's just go for it clearly before I sort of show you some examples, okay? And what I want you to understand is the power of e-portfolios, the most important thing is it's not separate from the teaching and learning. The, the, when you are working in, with e-portfolios, you don't need to separate the assessment and the teaching and learning. They are both together. So I'm in class, in, in this case, when I say activities in class, I mean online in a Zoom session with me, okay? So we're doing different activities online, and then the students are taking those activities. It might be to build a Google form. It might be because they've done a recorded themselves speaking. It might be a collaborative activity they've done with the rest of their group in Zoom. It might be something they've done after the Zoom session, but slowly, basically they're taking different elements from the course and they're putting them into their e-portfolio. They choose they choose what to embed. So as I'm teaching them online, slowly the e-portfolio builds up. And when they're doing this e-portfolio, at the same time, they have to write re a reflection every week about what they've done. Now, I think this is a really good moment to show you an example so you can clearly see what I mean. So I'm gonna just stop sharing and jump back and show you an example. I think I've got a couple hopefully open here on the screen. Let me just come back to the internet and I think I can grab it from there. One second. I'll just jump back to our Houses of Parliament and I'm just going to jump off and let's take a look at this one here. OK, now let's take a look at this one. Right. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. This is 
This is Natalia's. Now I've had got permission to show you this e-portfolio. So Natalia was doing a course with me. She's got a little bit of a profile page. And then what she's done is she's embedded all the different things that we did on the course. For example, she had to build two Google Forms. So they were learning to use Google Forms as, a, as an assessment uh, method. One as a quiz, one as a questionnaire. So she puts those into her e-portfolio. We've got an example of a Google Doc. So she's embedded that. Now this incidentally is collaborative. So this was actually a Google Doc done with other students together, but you'll see in a minute when I talk about Google Sites, because that's what we use. If different students work on a project together, all of those students are able to embed that into their e-portfolio. Okay, so let's imagine, for example, we've got four students working together. So all four students want a copy of the Google Doc or the Google Slide, etc. Well, because they've been collaborating on it equally or together, they will all have a copy in their Google Drive. So they can all take a copy and place it into their e-portfolio. That's one of the big advantages of working with Google Sites as an e-portfolio tool. So then we've got a Google Doc, we've got a Google Slide that she did, again, collaborative, collaboratively with other students. So this was a short course, it wasn't a long course this, but she's built this, so she's learned how to make the pages look nice, she's learned how to build a website, she's learned about layout, she's learned how to embed content into her e-portfolio, and then most importantly of all, she's learned about reflection. So every time she does another unit of the course, she has to reflect on what she's done and what she's learned. Now, this is the hardest part. The students, a lot of students get really into this. They, really, they start very negatively, but they get quite positive about the ideas of an e-portfolio. They love the way that apart from writing up the reflections, most of the stuff that they're doing is actually in class time and then it's just embedded into their e-portfolio. And a lot of people start to take quite a lot of pride in their e-portfolios and they want them to look nice and they want to learn about all the different things that they can do. So one of the powerful things about an e-portfolio is, first of all, it's continual. Number two, it's kind of embedded into the learning. Number three, there's a reflective part of it. Number four, it's a learning process in itself. We call that assessment for learning. They're basically, while they're doing the assessment, they are actually learning at the same time. There are so many benefits to working with e-portfolios because so many positive things come out of the process of actually the students building the e-portfolio. They always start negatively. They always start negatively. They always look at me with a dropped face, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in a blended learning course and I'm in the classroom. But I am continually using e-portfolios now to get my students to to uh, to uh, to do their um, to do their assessments, and so the final assessment is an evaluation of their e-portfolio. Uh, sometimes it, it might also include, if it's a bigger course, they writing a question about their e-portfolio as well. Sometimes it's just the e-portfolio; it's just the only assessment, giving them feedback on the e or e-portfolio, evaluating it, evaluating the quality of their reflections, making sure that they've added in all the different things that I want them to do. OK, and that is basically how I'm assessing these students. OK, so that's an example of one. Um, not a particularly brilliant one either. It was solid. She really made a big effort to lay it out and she got a bit better at the reflections. One of the hardest things when working with e-portfolios is how you need to help the students whether it be students of languages or, or in my case, teachers who are learning or kind of doing a master's degree in, or not necessarily a master's degree, sometimes they're just doing a simple course with me, but they all need help with reflection. They all need to move from understanding reflection in terms of an idea of um, just describing what they've done to really reflecting on it and saying, well, yeah, if I did it again, I would do this and this is what I've learned and this is how I might apply the knowledge in my job or this is 
what I've learned from my English lesson today, and this is why I think it could be useful. So the same process could be going on in a language class. In a language class, it's actually quite easy because often if you're getting the students to do things like engage in a discussion or record themselves speaking or do a writing piece, then the reflection is really interesting because you can get the students to reflect on, okay, you know, did you prepare your essay well? Did you think, did you plan it? Did you brainstorm it? Did you write more than one draft? So one of the hardest things to do, but one of the most rewarding things to do is to help the students with their reflections. So I find myself doing more and more work in that area. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back again to uh, the presentation. I think I've still got it on the screen somewhere. Let me just have a quick look. Yeah, uh, da, 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 da. yes, here we are. Just open it up. So the, an e-portfolio basically means we're doing activities in class or online or on, on the, you know, if we're using Moodle or if we're using whatever we're using. So the, doing these activities, they then choose themselves. So they get some autonomy in deciding what they want to embed into their e-portfolio. And you could see there the example of Natalie and she put the different things in and then she's writing her reflections. Now, this took a lot a, a while to get right, okay? So there are, were a few things that I needed to learn. I just want to talk about one of the big changes that helped me. And I, I did just try to explain this a minute ago. When we started to work with e-portfolios using Google Sites, before that, I, I played around with using blogging tools. I'd use Mahara for like a Moodle plugin. Um, but one of the good things about working with Google Sites is what I just explained to you. If the students are working collaboratively on an activity, so let's imagine you've got four students building a Google Doc together. That will mean that, let's say, even though they're building the Google Doc collaboratively, they want to have evidence of their learning. Now, the good thing about when students work is that when they contribute to something, they will have a copy of that Google Doc in their Google Drive, as long as they've collaborated on it. So the result is that student one can put his copy into his portfolio, student two can put her copy into her portfolio, student three, her copy. So the great thing is that when students work collaboratively, they've all still got a copy which they can share and put into their e-portfolio. Sometimes in the past, before um, Google Sites and before uh, when I was starting at the beginning to do this, it was quite tricky because sometimes students would do some kind of collaborative activity and you'd only have one copy of it. So then the students would be arguing, well, who's going to keep it to put into their e-portfolio? But with the embedding and with these, these abilities now to, to collaborate together on, on, a, on something and then have copies of it, everybody now can obviously take a copy of whatever they produce collaboratively and put it into their e-portfolio. Google Sites has really facilitated this and it makes, makes it really easy to use. I'm going to quickly show you Google Sites in a minute. I know most of you will probably know it, but I'll just to make a couple of points. A few other things that um, we learn about Google, about uh, doing e-portfolios. And I'm also going to show you actual, some of my actual online courses so you can see an example of where I'm, I'm actually using them. But just a couple of points. So first of all, always, I always link the e-portfolio to the lesson. And what I mean by that is if you're doing a lesson and the students are doing their e-portfolios, okay, which obviously a lot of the time, sometime they're going to be doing it in the class, in class time, if it's a blended learning class. In an online course, not so much. They tend to do it afterwards, take the content from the activities they've been doing and put them in their e-portfolio. But it's important sometimes to bring the e-portfolio into the live session. In other words, don't kind of ignore the e-portfolio. Make sure that it's continually embedded into your live sessions. If you're using Zoom and the students do something collaboratively in Padlet or maybe in, you know, in, in one of these in Google Docs or in Google Slides or Google Forms, or if they do any type of collaborative thing, say to them, right, don't forget, guys, put that into your e-portfolio. Don't forget to reflect on it. Sometimes I will take someone's e-portfolio and say, right, this week we're going to look at Maria's e-portfolio. She's doing a really good job. Maria, turn on your audio and just quickly take the rest of the teachers or the rest of the students through your e-portfolio and tell us what you've been doing. So I link it to the lesson. I make sure that I'm continually referring to the e-portfolios in the lesson. And I will do activities where I will get the students to teachers, the students, 
to show their e-portfolio to the rest of the class so everyone can see the progress of the other students. Now, another thing I do is I have study buddies. So I put the students in pairs and I actually ask them to be looking at each other's uh, each other's um, e-portfolios and commenting on them and that they've got to be continually doing that. So even through the process of writing the e-portfolio, already somebody is looking at it. When they make their e-portfolio, they only have to share it with two people, me and their study buddy. And so that allows me at any stage I want to, if I want to make any comments about it, Okay, then I can. So every so often I will look at the e-portfolios, perhaps leave a few comments. Yeah, etc. But I'm continually linking it back to the classroom. And the last thing is that I began to realize that the, quite a lot of the students will get quite enthusiastic about this. If I can. No, generally they do. Generally, as I said, the, the feedback is very positive. But what they really struggle with is the reflection. So that's where I do quite a lot of work in, in terms of supporting the e-portfolio. Not so much teaching them how to use Google Sites. I might show them things. They might say to me, Russell, I don't know how to embed or Russell, I don't know how to create sub pages. So I sometimes do little sessions in Zoom showing them how to do that. Most of the time, though, I'm focusing on reflection, how they can become more reflective. And what I'm hoping is over a period of the e-portfolio, they will learn to reflect more effectively. So move from simply describing their e what they're doing to actually saying, well, this week in the lesson, we, we did an essay on or we did a, les a lesson plan. And uh, if I did it again, I think I would have done a better job brainstorming and I would have... Um, thought more about the topic because I just did it really quickly, blah, blah, blah. So I try to get them to really think about what they're learning, if they did it again, how they could do it better, and also what might be the value of what they're learning. So this week we've learned about presentations. Presentations could be really important because blah, blah, blah. Well, this week we've learned the present simple, and the present simple means now I can describe my habits, blah, blah, blah. So trying to continually get them to develop their reflections. Now, one of the hardest things about e-portfolios is the <laughs> feedback. And it was interesting for me because when you when you give someone feedback on their e-portfolio, you're kind of writing about their e-portfolio and the e-portfolio is on the screen and then you're sort of writing in a Word document or something to give them feedback. And it's not very satisfactory. satisfactory. But the thing is, I'd already done some work on feedback that before this that I thought, hang on, my work on feedback is really relevant to this. Now, Mary said at the beginning that I'd won a few awards. It was because of this feedback idea. So now I'm going to marry two things, the e-portfolio idea and something else that I was always doing, which is what we call video feedback or screen capture feedback. And I'm just going to demo what I mean by that. So I'm just going to stop sharing very quickly, come back again. And in fact, what I'm in fact, thinking about it, let me just screen share. I'm probably going to just for this part, I'll need to actually just jump out. I'll jump onto here and come back into that minute and just sort of show you something very quickly. We can use screen capture to give feedback to our students, okay? That is that we have the ability to record ourselves going over a student's work. Screen capture technology is a technology that allows us to record whatever's on the screen of our computer. And I use this a lot for giving feedback to my students. So for example, I can click on screen capture technology. I've got one here called Snagit. There are loads and loads of these around. I can kind of mark out an area on the screen. And I could now click on the record button and record myself giving feedback to this student on her e-portfolio. And as I move through the pages, okay, that would still work. So in theory, I could click on this button here now the recording would start. I could give feedback to Natalia on her first page and I could move to the next page. I could move to the next page. I could move to the next page. I could go right through her e-portfolio. I could come to the reflections. I can scroll through it and I can do all that as a video. I've got no need to write down my feedback. I can actually go directly through her e-portfolio, click on the stop button, that video is now ready. It's already done. Okay, I'm using a technology called Snagit. There are many of these technologies around. I can now send this to Natalia. 
So this is the way I'm giving feedback to her. I'm not writing the feedback out. I'm literally opening up her ePortfolio on the screen and then making a video. I could give feedback to Natalia on her first page and I could move to the next page. I could move to the next page. I could move to the next page. I could go right through. So this is the way that I actually give the feedback to Natalia. I'm not um, writing my feedback. Rather, I'm creating a video and sending that video to Natalia as the way that I give the feedback to her. And that is really powerful. That is a game changer in terms of the way I'm kind of organizing the feedback for that student. OK, just going to jump back onto the screen here. I was going to just show you some of my early examples of doing this. So I also do this with my students, even in their written work. OK, here's an example. One, remember I told you that um, I didn't start ePortfolios with Google Sites. I was using blog. This here is another example. Okay, Joe, uh, nice to see that you've created more than one page on your blog and you've learned how to do that. That's really, really nice. And um, I really like the uh, color combination. It's very, very easy to, to read your blog and you've kept your um, uh, fonts uh, nice. And okay, so I again, I make video feedback to give feedback to, this is a really old one. This is like about 2000 and maybe 2012, 2013, before I'd even started using Google Sites, when I just started this kind of ePortfolio idea and I was using Blogger. But again, I didn't give written feedback. I gave video feedback. Now, I actually use this for all the things I do online. So let's say a student sends me their essay online. Let me show you an example. Yeah, I just want to provide you with a little bit of feedback on your essay. And the first thing I want to point out is just we come down to here, and I was noticing that you were talking about, I think you're not describing very clearly exactly what uh, screen capture does. And I think it's very important that we explain that if you highlight anything, if you write anything, if you move your cursor, on the screen, on the student's written work, then that comes out in the essay because I don't think you're making that point. Okay, so you get the idea here that we don't, we're not limited to always giving students written feedback. And particularly when we're doing an e-portfolio, it's really powerful because I can open the student's e-portfolio on the screen and then I can simply record myself giving them the feedback and then send them the video. Therefore, they can see me talking on their screen and obviously going through the work. And this is really a game changer in terms of the way we can give feedback to our students. So it's something that I, I do all the time. So this is why I pointed out the feedback idea is really powerful. And I've been doing that since about 2006 for written work. And then now I use it also when I'm giving feedback on students' blogs or on students' e-portfolios. Rather than me simply do a written paper, I open their e-portfolio on the screen and I give them feedback on their e-portfolio. And I find that it really works to get lots of good feedback on it. Now, that feedback idea, I first wrote about that. Uh, I had a lot of publicity and it was the reason for my awards originally. Uh, the idea of using screen capture technology, this ability to record yourself, just mark an area on the screen and record yourself speaking. Now, I don't, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with these technologies, but they are actually, some of them are free and pretty good. I'm just going to quickly show you a free example, just in case you're not familiar with them. So this, these, are, these screen capture technologies, one of the most common kind of free ones that we can see is, if I just click here, sorry, is Screencast-O-Matic. Okay, so if I just quickly click on this one here, so this is a really nice example of a free tool. I click on here. You don't even need to log in. Just click on Start Recorder for free, and then click on Launch Free Recorder. You get a little kind of window that opens. Hopefully it's gonna open. Let me just click here. So we just have to wait a few seconds for the for, for the recorder to download. There it is. Now all I need to do is open on the screen whatever I want to talk about. So let's imagine that I'm going to give feedback to this student, okay, on her ePortfolio. So this is another student that's done her ePortfolio. Okay, so I can open it up and I can click on record. 
and start to record myself going through the student's e-portfolio. So I'd click here. Now I can go through the student's e-portfolio, start from the home page, explain, yeah, go through, uh, look at some of the content that she's uploaded. So she's done lots of different things. I can go through it and look at everything she's embedded discuss yeah, lots of collaborative activities she's done together. Then I can come over to the reflections. This wasn't a particularly good one, but this was a very short course and a very intensive course, but I can just go through and give her comments and then I can stop, save that recording and send it to the student. So there it is, the feedback is already made. I can go through the student's e-portfolio, start from the home page, explain, yeah, go through. So this uh, is how I'm giving feedback to students, not only on their written work. If a student sends me their essay, I'm doing exactly the same. I'm opening up screen capture technology, Screencast-O-Matic, Snagit, Camtasia, QuickTime. There are many of these tools. And I'm recording myself going through the student's work, and then I'm sending that to the student. It's got real value. They can see me going through their work, and they can hear what I'm saying. And, of course, they can then make changes to their e-portfolio, et cetera. So really, really powerful way of kind of simplifying and making more value out of the feedback as well. So not only uh, am I talking here about e-portfolios e as a way of assessing, and, and it's a way that's becoming more and more popular. And I personally think of all the work I've done and the value I've seen and the feedback from my students, I'd say it's one of the, as I said earlier, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I'm also using this feedback idea as the way that I give the feedback to the students. I don't do any written feedback. They get a video from me, which is brilliant online because in an online course, you don't have a lot of contact with your students. And so it's wonderful for the students to hear your voice and to see you going through their work. We call that teacher presence. So lots of people like this kind of feedback idea. They talk about it giving, making the, helping to bring the students closer to the student. Here's some feedback from a research in, by Matteson in 2012. There is a reason to claim that through the use of screen capture as a medium of feedback, a closeness desired by the studio, students is created with the teachers. But this is absolute gold dust when you're working online because you really want to build a relationship with those students. They don't see you. So for them to hear your voice and hear you going through the work is really, really important, okay? And students often like it because they feel like it's like you being beside them, as this second student says, or using audio feedback, and she actually meant here um, vis uh, video feedback because we were actually using video on this, this piece of research. Using uh, audio feedback is a very useful way of giving feedback. It makes me feel as if you are beside me. So we often have, when we're teaching online, this big problem of teacher presence. Suddenly, when you're using this as the way to give feedback to the students, then, then you can build your teacher presence with your students because they hear you, they stay, can uh, see you going through their work. But it's even got more value when it's an e-portfolio because an e-portfolio is such a difficult thing to give feedback on because you're writing about the layout, about the organization, about the content, about the quality of the reflections. It's so much easier to do when you can just simply record yourself going over it, okay? Lots of lovely feedback on this idea. Um, one comment from this uh, research that took place in TESOL, Canada, I think this was, or, or this is in, certainly in, in Canada, Serro, Jerome Serro, uh, saying that the students like the fact they can play the videos back time and time again. They get this video feedback and they can keep playing it back. So video feedback is also part of it. So when I'm making these suggestions to you, I'm saying A, you could think about e-assessments, but you can think about e-portfolios as building them up. You don't have to start by doing a complete e-portfolio. You could start like I did. I started with just getting my students to do three recordings a year. That now I realized was an e-portfolio. It was a very narrowly defined e-portfolio that only looked at, at speaking. Now I do very broad e-portfolios that include lots of different things, but they are e-portfolios. The students are building up a portfolio evidence of their learning and over a period of time, as long as it's got a reflective element in it. Without the reflective element, it's not quite an e-portfolio. So you always need to have those two things, the, the evidence of learning and then the obviously the reflective statements. 
I'll jump this um, just because it was just a little bit more about why the video feedback is such a good idea, but you can look at it if we share these um, uh, handouts uh, with you afterwards. But as I said, this third point, that video feedback builds teacher presence and teacher presence is so vital in an online course. Okay, so for me, the role of the e-portfolio and the role of the feedback are both contributing towards really giving value to the way I'm assessing my students. And I really like the results of it, okay? Now, just before I conclude, I just thought I should show you, I might be able to do this, I'm hoping I can. I'm just gonna stop sharing and jump out one final time, come back onto, my, onto uh, the website. And I'm gonna see if I can even quickly show you um, from one of my courses, sort of how the e-portfolios work. So if I come to here, and I just log in, I think I can do this. It's gonna come down to, I've got here, one of my courses, da, 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 yeah, evaluation assessment in the, okay, so this is, a, this is a course, a completely online course, okay? So I'm using Moodle for this course. And the way that it basically works is that the students work through a unit of content. Normally there are Zoom sessions every two units. They work through the unit's content and it can be a bit of video and maybe some reading. Uh, there's not normally things to do. And then there's at the end of the unit, there's a specific task. And that task is the e-portfolio, what they need for that particular week to put into their e-portfolio. For example, this week it was to produce a Google Doc. So every, every unit they are adding content into their e-portfolio. This is completely online. And it would be similar if I was doing language teaching, okay? As I said, I do much more teacher training now. I don't do any language teaching actually now, but I did do it at the beginning. I was doing both language teaching and uh, e-portfolios for teachers. So it's basically fully online and there is a task related to each unit that's asking them to take something from whatever they've done that week on the lesson and embed that into their e-portfolio and then to comment on it. And that's basically how I'm organizing it. And then I'm giving the feedback via the fact that I um, use this, this idea of, of screen capture feedback. Right, we're nearly at the end then, so just a few things to say. Um, ah, sorry, I've actually, yeah, sorry, I've, I've, I should, should have, um, I've not, I've, I've talked more about the, um, in, apologies, I've, I've talked more here about the, the uh, importance of the feedback uh, rather than talking about the e-portfolio itself. Let me just jump back to, to remind you the points I was trying to make because there, are, if we come back to this screen here, this is, yeah? E-portfolios can be collaborative. Students can be working on a document and they can then include a copy of that document into their e-portfolio. They're inclusive. They can include Google Slides, they can include audio, they can include video, they can include writing. So they can include a whole range of different things. They can include things they've done in pairs on their own. It's formative because students are adding to it as they go along. And if you're giving them feedback on what they're doing and they're reflecting on it, there's a process of learning continually taking place. OK, so it's another thing. It's continual. It's reflective. It's about learning. One of the biggest comments I get is that, Russell, we learn so much when we do an e-portfolio. We learn so much about how you make a website, how you lay it out, how you embed content, etc. It's embedded. There is no separation between, or, or that much separation between what the students do on the course and the assessment, because as they work through the assessment, they put that content into their assessment. It's autonomous because the students are working on their own and they get lots of decisions that they take themselves. They have a certain choice over what they want to put in their e-portfolios. They also make choices about the design and layout of their pages. A lot of people take a, a lot of uh, interest in their e-portfolios and try to really um, make them look nice as well. Okay. So, just going to go back to the last couple of pages. Okay, and it's interesting if you think now, sorry I was so negative about my e-portfolio at the start of the course, I realize now that I didn't know much about doing them. Doing the flipped classroom course has been great, but the best part was the e-portfolio. I have learned about building a website because when you're working with e-portfolios, you're building some sort of website, whether it be using Google Sites, whether it be using another website tool, 
uh, you know, or even perhaps something like Mahara, embedding content, design and the lay layout, so many things. Now I need to understand more about reflection. So there is a learning process taking place when you do an e-portfolio as well. The key to e-portfolios, though, is to build them up. I'm not saying you have to dive in at the beginning and um, really, you know, do a lot of, um, do a complete e-portfolio. It might be something you build up. It took me a long time. You know, in my that history, that story goes back almost, almost 13, well, it does. It goes back 14, 15 years. I put some references in and I found also the inspiration for the speaking ideas. This is how I started with that idea of getting my students to record themselves. And this here is that really wonderful, and I've managed to find a copy of it, really wonderful article from IC Lee about portfolio writing. And that's how I moved to e-portfolios and this whole idea of the students self-evaluating as well and doing a ref or, or, and then he moved on to reflection. Now, what I have done is I've made a special handout for you if you're interested. So uh, I released a video on YouTube. I have a very popular YouTube, well, very popular. It's not very popular, but it has 25,000 subscribers, a popular YouTube channel that people follow. And recently, I just released a new video about three different ways of assessing online. That includes using Google Forms. That includes the ideas around getting students to, to record themselves speaking. And thirdly, e-portfolios. I've then done a video for you about how you build an e-portfolio. I actually take you through the process of building a complete e-portfolio. I've then done a video about the feedback idea. If you like this idea about video feedback and giving feedback to students rather than written feedback, then recording yourself going through their work and sending them the feedback, then you might be interested in that idea, particularly relevant if you're teaching online. And then lastly, um, just in case you're interested, at the moment, uh, the or one of the organisations that I work with, very prestigious organisation in here in the UK called Nile Norwich Institute of Language Education, they're running a free online course on how to teach online. And obviously, at the moment, people are very interested in Zoom. They're very interested in how they're going to teach online, teach language courses online. It's a free course. I think about three and a half thousand students or teachers have already done that course. You might be interested in that as well. And if you want to follow my work, then you can also do that as well. So if you want this handout, so all of these videos are completely free. This course is free. And you might, you might want to sign up to my newsletter if you want to follow the work I do. All you need to do is email me at teachertrainingvideos at gmail.com teacher training videos at gmail.com just write the subject tsol and then just write to me hello i am blah 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 from blah 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 automatically automatically you will get that handout repeat if you want the handout with those free videos just teacher training videos at gmail.com just send me an email and automatically it will be sent to you. All you need to do is put in a subject, just write TSOL, and then just write, hello, I am blah, 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 from blah, blah, blah. Just, just interesting for me to see where you're from. And that will give you that handout. At that point, I'm going to stop. I really hope the technology has worked. Uh, I'm going to hand back now to Mary. So I'm going to jump back in. Um, Mary, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. And do not worry, everybody is uh, watching your your live session. I mean, we have people for, and from everywhere. Where are you? Uh, turn on your, your video so everybody can see I will do, I will you. do. And right, that, lovely. So there are people from Greece, from Latin America, Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador. There are people from Pakistan, Iran. Uh, there are people from Dominican Republic, United States, um, all over the world, in India. Uh, there are ma many people from uh, many places here. And um, I mean, they have many comments. I will read some of the comments. I cannot read all of them because there are many comments. I will see the, the questions at the end. Um, someone says, Maria Martinez says, for example, my university uses Foliotech for all pre-service teachers and future teachers. Um, someone else asks here, what platforms do you use for e-portfolios? And you mentioned Google Sites. Yeah, Google Sites. In that handout I've given you, uh, you, there is a video where I show you how I use Google Sites. I take you through the whole thing. 
Google Sites is great. It really does work well. It was almost an accident. They didn't plan it to be a portfolio tool, but it actually works really well. Obviously, there are specific portfolio tools as well, but Google Sites is free, easy to use, and I use it a lot with my students when I'm doing e-portfolios. Okay. Um, Deborah Hailey also says, I like Google Sites uh, for e-portfolios because learners can keep the site after the class ends. With Blackboard, the learner's work disappeared with the end of the exactly. course. Exactly. Really good point. Very true. And that's what I was saying about my student who's kept her e-portfolio going now for another seven months after the course. I think that it's important that the students have that have got possession of the e-portfolio. It's theirs. So that's why I like using Google Sites because it means it's their e-portfolio portfolio they can take it away they have all the information about the course so i think that's really important yeah okay jane jane chen says i really like the reflections part of this e-portfolio e all on one page i ask my students to record their reflections on flipgrid they don't get to keep their own reflections in one place yeah that's interesting and i've actually done something similar so sometimes instead of getting the students to write their reflections i've actually got the students to do an audio reflection and i have to say that's worked quite well i've done that a few times so yes it's a nice idea and they can i don't know about in flipgrid but if they they now most of the time they can do a recorded reflection and embed it into the e-portfolio so i've actually got examples where often towards the end of the course, mm -hmm. instead of getting the students to write the reflection, I get them to record it. Never do it at the beginning because they won't be reflecting very well, but maybe by week five or week 10 of the course, then is a really good time to get the students to do a recorded reflection or the final reflection at the end of the course. Mm -hmm. What did they think about e-portfolios? It's a really good point. Yeah, really good. Um, there is a question here, important. Uh, do you think e-portfolios can work well with young, le young learners? Right. It's, I, I think it's a difficult one to say because some people say yes, because people, you know, young learners, if they're, say, learning to paint or do anything arty, sometimes even in primary school, kids had to collect different things together and make a little portfolio. The only thing is I'm not so always so keen with young learners spending so much time in front of a computer. That's my problem. I, and I'm not, so I worry about that. I, I think it's a really good question. I honestly don't know the answer. I don't work enough with young people. All the e-portfolios I'm doing are all with adults. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. 16. I've done it with Japanese students, 16 and above, but no, no, no younger than that. Okay. But I, in my, my experience. Good question. Mm-hmm. And then, um, who else here I have? Uh -huh. Okay, I have some questions here. I'm looking for the questions. And... Okay. Uh -huh. Here, Deborah Hiley, this is a comment. She says, I found screencasting my comments to be very helpful when doing face-to-face -face, uh, writing conference too, and so helpful online. Okay, so that was my idea that won me all these awards, the awards that Mary mentioned. I wrote about that idea in 2006. I had it in the newspapers. It generated a lot of publicity for me. I saw screen capture, and at the time, I was very interested in feedback, and I put the two together, and I thought, wow, I can just record myself and give feedback to my students as a video and I began to do it way back then. And a funny story was that the company whose technology I was using, they contacted me from America. There was Camtasia and they said, Russell, what is this about you doing video feedback? I said, yeah, because your technology, you can use it to give feedback to students. They said, we don't understand. This technology is for computer training. Will you fly to America and tell us what you're doing? So they paid for me to go over to America and present my work uh, at TechSmith. So that was a, a free trip to America on the back of that idea. And I know now that that idea is very popular. Okay, great. Um, here I have a question from Mohammed E. El Azri. He said, how do your students react to this type of feedback? They love it. Honestly, the feedback is incredible. It really is 
the, you know, as I said, there are two things that I kind of, in my own teaching and learning or in my, my how I've learned as a teacher that I think are really interesting, the feedback idea and e-portfolios. Both those are the two significant things in my life in terms of my teaching career, where I thought, wow, this is good. This is working. The feedback idea, just like the e-portfolio idea, it developed. I got better and better at doing it. At the beginning, I used to give the feedback and give too much feedback. Now I will take a piece of work. I will give them five major comments and say, right, here's the feedback, five ways to improve your work. At the beginning, I was so excited with this idea that I could give video feedback. I went crazy and I used to give them too much feedback. But, you know, it's a learning process when you're doing these things. But for me, you, you literally today, what I presented is the two things that I think in terms of my own experience as a teacher, have had the biggest impact on my students, e-portfolios and that feedback idea. Okay. Um, here, one of our, our attendees, I think she's from Japan. I'm not sure because her name is, you know, using another type of uh, written form. She says, audio feedback truly worked to improve teacher-student closeness. Absolutely. So this idea that I was talking about, and it's in the research, teacher presence. We, we wrote about it. We published a paper, I think, in 2018 with a, a guy called Steve Mann. It's, if we give you the handout, it's in there. We talked about this teacher presence. If your students don't see you and suddenly you make a video to give them feedback, that is really powerful. They can play it and say, wow, I can hear and see you on the screen. So that is the... Uh, really, really, for me, it's absolutely vital. It really does m have a, a big impact on students. They love it. They can keep replaying the video mm -hmm. as well. Yes, of course. So yeah. here we have another question from Judith Teacher. She says, how do you use video feedback with low level language learners? Is it the same as for? Yes, no, it's really good. Okay, so this is that's a really good question mm -hmm. and it is hard. Because sometimes if you're giving the feedback to the student and the feedback is higher than their level, then it's really hard to give the feedback in English. Sometimes you have to go, if you can, you give the feedback in the L1. So I see that sometimes teachers do that. They give the feedback in the first language because the feedback is so important. So no, I think with low levels, it can be quite hard, definitely, to use that method. It's much more difficult. It works much better when the students have got to a certain level because then the feedbacks in English, they're learning their English as well as getting the feedback. But I admit at very low levels, that can be a problem. Okay, so good. So here I have many people asking if you are going to share the handout. Now you already said that if they sent a message to, uh, can you repeat the, the, your email address? Yeah, so I, I'm not going to give you the hand, that presentation, but the handout is just as good because the videos in it go through everything that we've just exactly. talked about, okay? The feedback idea, the e-portfolio idea, and how to make an e-portfolio as well. So just go, uh, let me open it up onto the, no, it's just teachertrainingvideos at gmail.com. Teachertrainingvideos at gmail.com. I think I could just screen share it. We can leave the, yeah. let me just, and many people are also screen. writing it. Uh, I mean, there we are. Teacher training videos at gmail.com. It will come automatically to you. Just put subject TSO. Hello, I am blah, blah, blah from blah, blah, blah. Just interested to see where you're from. It will be sent automatically. Teacher training videos at gmail.com. Okay, yeah. make sure it's videos. Okay, many people thanking from everywhere in the world. Uh, I mean, you, you will see it later when I post. When, when we can we can see the video uh, on, on this channel. And, uh, but there is a question here that I think is uh, interesting and many people uh, would like to know, how can we help ESL students interact and improve their speaking skills? Can we consider um, e-portfolios for, uh, for that purpose? Well, definitely, because obviously, Mary, what I was saying, the early e-portfolios I was doing was just getting the students to record themselves speaking and then putting that into their e-portfolio. I wasn't asking them to do other things. Remember, an e-portfolio can be e-portfolio only writing or e-portfolio only speaking. Yeah, you don't have to do an e-portfolio that includes everything. It can be an e-portfolio that only focuses on one particular thing. So I did my early e-portfolios were only getting my students to record themselves speaking. 
Now, I really like that idea of trying to get the students to record themselves speaking. It's something I started long time ago when I was teaching Spanish rather than English. And I did many experiments and many went wrong because students are reluctant to do it. But I think it's really powerful because it really does help students to the whole process of planning a recording taking notes, brainstorming ideas, thinking about what they're gonna say, recording themselves speaking, and then afterwards reflecting on what they did. Could they improve it next time? What did they do wrong? What, what do they think of the recording? Was the PowerPoint slides okay? Could they improve them? There's so much involved in that activity. So I'm a really big fan of getting my students to kind of, uh, to, to, to record themselves. I'm not saying it's always easy. I think one of the things that you have to do is explain to the students the value of doing it. If they understand that, yeah, look, this is really useful. And if you can get into that habit of, of make, you can't get them to do it all the time. You can, you can maybe do one a term or two a term. But I think that for me personally, it's a really interesting, I do it now. So I'm learning Polish and I record myself speaking in Polish. <laughs> so I did good. it in French, I did it in Chinese. Very good, excellent. So, yeah. uh, I mean, Russell has given us many ideas, not only for teaching, uh, but also for learning, you see. Um, okay, uh, well, I, there are many, many, many other comments here, but it's kind of late. And um, um, I, I would like to thank you, everybody, attendees, and Russell principally for, uh, from being here. Um, I mean, it's been great. I was trying to answer and to welcome everybody to the, you know, to the, to the live session but I was just paying attention to you because the presentation was really interesting. And I, was, I wanted to know more about all the things you were saying. Very good, I, I, I love it. And I, all the people, when you see all the, you know, the, 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 the statements, all the things that people wrote in the chat, you will see that people were crazy in love with the presentation, really. Lovely. Okay. I'm really, that's lovely, it's lovely to hear. Lovely yeah. to hear. Thank you very much, Russell. It has been yeah. an honor and I'm proud to have you here. Thank you for, for you know, for responding positively to my invite and for the invite of uh, uh, Tiso Cola, yes. Thank you very Cheers, much. Lovely. Thank you very much. Cheers, Mary. Lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And yeah. Um, well, uh, it's time to say see you soon uh, with a new webinar. Next next month, we're going to have another webinar and a new special speaker as uh, Russell Stannard. And uh, please stay safe and healthy. Take care. We love you all. Very important. Cheers. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, Mary. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. See you later. See you later.